excited in church this morning. We're going to have a good day. It's Vision Builder Sunday. Come on, I want you to know that God is not unaware of your life. That God has a plan for our church. We're going to talk about that today. But I don't want you to leave here thinking it's just about our church. God's plan is about you. When God thought about you in the very beginning, when God created you, He created you with a plan and a purpose in mind. And so I want you to know, wherever you are, whatever seat you picked, God sees you this morning. And it's not just about what's going to happen in this church. It's about what's already happening in the lives of the people all around this place. And today, as we surrender our hearts in worship, as we commit ourselves in a few minutes to the Word, if you'll commit your life, ask God, Holy Spirit, have your way in my life. I'm telling you, today will be a brand new day in your world. You ready for that today, church? Come on, let's do it. Hey, grab a seat. Man, you can be dismissed. And before we begin our Vision Builder Sunday, we've got a short presentation for you, a video. It's going to be fantastic. So if you would, the guys are going to dim the lights. Just check it on the screen behind me. You won't believe this. Hello, church. I want to thank you for participating in the vision and future of C3 Church and to let you know that you are part of something big that God is doing right now inside of the house of C3. What excites me most about this year's campaign is that it's based off of a prophetic word that was given to us about two and a half years ago. This campaign, it's not built off of clever marketing schemes, uh, church statistics, church analytics. No, this year's campaign is built off of a prophetic word that came to us on March the 11th, 2015. In our church's history, when we were at a crossroads, Pastor Phil Beekler from C3 Long Island came and spoke a word of our church out of Isaiah 37 that put us into a new season. He spoke about us putting roots down, growing up and flourishing in the house of God. Listen to these prophetic words, listen to these testimonies of not just of what God wants to do, but what God is doing. And keep in mind that we are in the third year from when that prophetic word was spoken. It's from Isaiah 37, verses 30 to 31, and it says this, You shall eat this year, that first year, such as grows of itself, and the second year what springs from the same, and also in the third year sow and reap, plant vineyards, and eat the fruit of them. It's in that third year, this very year right now, that you sow, that you plant, that you invest, and you get ready for the next verse. For the remnant who have escaped the house of Judah, the remnant in the Bible is always the called that commit themselves in crisis and challenge in difficult circumstances. The remnant who have escaped the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. Church, you're in your year and the years to come of bearing fruit upward. When I first walked into C3 Church, I just thought, whoa, what is this place? It was completely different than any place I'd ever been. Uh, nine years ago, when I first came to C3, I was uh, one of those guys that went straight for the cave, all the way in the back, don't talk to me, leave me alone. I remember walking in those doors feeling absolutely destroyed. I was kind of like just going through the motions. I was running around church. I was doing this and doing that. And I was very busy, intentionally doing things to avoid connecting with people. You know, our testimony isn't huge as stories go, but it certainly was big for us. You know, we've had just a lot of stress in our lives. We've had family problems with um, our daughter's health has been a real issue, uh, created a lot of stress um, for, for her and for us. So our story starts about 15 years ago. Um, we were young, we were definitely in love and... Got married and had two kids right off the bat and um we started yeah. making really bad decisions and mm -hmm. hanging out with just some some bad people and and making those same sort of, of bad mistakes that they were making and yeah and um and then the kids started paying you know paying the price for it and mm -hmm. and our marriage started declining and um I was in and out for yeah. for six years and for a lot until Anna finally had enough. <clears throat> So she divorced me. I started, um, you know, meeting people and really feeling love and encouragement from them. Like I'd never seen, it completely changed the course of my life. I was going through a divorce, 
I was uh, very career focused. Uh, I worked a ton of hours. I took purpose driven life and I didn't know what my purpose in life was. I was going through health issues. I was diagnosed with fibroid, uterine fibroid tumors and they were sucking the life out of me. I was dealing with financial issues. My husband shut down his business of 17 years with absolutely no plan in place of what we were going to do. My appetites and my addictions were ruling the choices that I was making. A part of those choices were causing a lot of harm and damage to the people around me, especially to my family. And you don't realize that you've closed God out of areas of your life. And one of the things I think for us was, was finances. You know, we had five children all pretty close together. And so over the course of our youth, we made some decisions that weren't really great. And we ended up, you know, quite honestly, with a lot of debt. I have a restaurant that um, is not doing as well as it should. And I've really just learned that I, that's not the right place for me. I was worried all the time about what's going to happen. I didn't have any disability while I was out of work for surgery. And the bills kept coming in. And I had no idea how I was going to fix the situation. So three years ago, um, I was just completely done with that, with that life. So it wasn't like, oh, he made this decision and like, snap, everything's perfect. I had always um, been very anxious and fearful, shy, reserved, and I didn't really see a lot of possibilities for my life. I was uh, just kind of going through the motions. Uh, I guess you could say it's the do going through the doldrums. We just felt like we had made a huge mess, and in some ways, Maybe we were even a little embarrassed to have to go, um, God, we made this big mess, but we decided that we would. We said, Lord, Father, we know that you care about us and you care about everything in our, in our world. So here is this thing that we're dealing with and would you come and help us? We were holding on to those. We thought we were giving them to God, but we weren't. And so finally we gave it to God by prayer, through devotionals and really connecting with our church. I got, I got a job. Um, which in turn helped me get my own place. Mm -hmm. I got a vehicle. I didn't have to rely on Anna and, and she didn't have to, you know, drop what she was doing to, to take care of me. And uh, okay. with, with just a $10 an hour job as a laborer, you know, working real hard every day, but it was, it was instilling that self-worth in me that, that I think I lacked all, you know, all those years. God really was leading me to serve in youth ministry which was absolutely crazy because I didn't like teenagers or, and I didn't ever dream I would be doing that. You know, Pastor Jeff and Sonny started to challenge us to trust God in ways that we hadn't done before. And during worship, hearing his voice, hearing the Holy Spirit speak to my pain and my fear of losing my family. And during uh, hearing Pastor Jeff speak, you know, having the truth of the word, you know, really resonate inside of me to give me the strength and the resolution that it was going to take to walk this process out. But, you know, God was totally faithful. I missed C3 Church and... I missed uh, the connection, the I missed family. the connection, because God had always served me there. I just wasn't mature enough to, you know, to, to realize what He was doing. About a little over a year after you came back, we met with Jim, Pastor Jim and Donna. Yep. And I'm Two just, of our favorite people. Just... <laughs> wanted to, um, you know, figure out what the next steps were um, as far as, because we wanted to be a family again and not just a family of our five, but a, but a family with C3, with my family, you know. Yeah, her sisters, her sister's husbands. Yeah. Um, you know, that's something that I miss too, because, you know, Anna's very close to, to her sisters and, and yeah. you know, that was a, a relationship that, that... That honestly we thought was, I mean, well, he thought, there was no hope. Throughout all of the recovery, without my disability, blessings were coming in that were almost equivalent to the disability that I would have gotten. When we started planning for a summer fest, um, I wasn't going to be able to go, but God provided a new job for me that was more than I ever could have imagined and also allowed me to get more involved and attend summer fest. Then God awakened me to this call for brutal honesty. And the brutal honesty part is very painful, um, but it's, I would w much rather have honesty in dealing with it and getting freedom than living in the dark and being naive about it. I 
was serving more, volunteering more, and through that, uh, I drew closer to Jesus. And he absolutely surprised us. You know, when we brought it to him, the way that he took care of it and opened doors that we never imagined would open for us. And he totally cleaned it up for us. <laughs> we had to just turn this over to God. And when that, was the, that was the key thing for us, is really just stepping away from the problems. So we went to the marriage class, we started being obedient, we started serving, mm -hmm. Ann and I started tithing our 10%, right. and things just took off from, from there. We had faith for the future at the Encounter Conference and mm -hmm. just that small amount of money that we... That step. That seed that we planted. Yeah. You know, just, and it wasn't a whole lot of money. It was just a, it was, well, it was trust, afford. you know? Yeah. We, we were putting trust in the Lord and and with what little bit that we had. And, and then a week later, um, my company that, that I worked for called me in and they gave me a raise. I don't have a need to be insecure or scared anymore. He's given me a new identity. Um, that is just incredible. Where, where I'm at now is I have so much more peace in my life. I seldom have anxiety, I seldom have stress. Companies would call and say, hey, we'll put it off until you get back to work. And so things just kind of started working out and little drops of faith turned into big splashes of faith. God restored our marriage and we even have you know, they say judge a uh, plant by its fruit. You know, we were we had Killian, our youngest son, uh, in the middle of this. And almost overnight, we got delivered to the point that we're totally out of debt. And that opened the door for us to start giving more and to be involved with vision builders and to be able to go beyond the tithe and to start doing offerings. And it seems like the more you pour in, the more God keeps pouring back out. And so Christy's now healing. She's on the path, almost there. And Bill's business, we have a buyer, so things are great. From, from that encounter conference and faith for the future. From two years ago. Two years ago, I have tripled, tripled my salary. I mean, and I feel like it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily about the money. It was about that God was giving us hope. Yeah, You know, definitely. We still like look at each other sometimes and are like, this is our world. Just in awe. This is our life. You know, just in awe of what you God know? has done for our family. Our, we're thriving. Our kids are thriving. Our family, I mean, we're like best friends with my sisters and their husbands. He's given us this hope. Like, look at when you turn your eyes toward me. Yes. And look at what I can give you. I want to give you this. It's not just for me and him no. and for our kids and for our immediate family and it's for future generations and, you know, people that are in our influences and, you know, who we can help bring to this life, you know, this amazing life. It's not all about like, oh, our life is perfect every day or, you know, but it's... It's pretty close. <laughs> I am a vision builder because I want other people to find full life at C3 Church. We are vision builders because we believe that God is faithful to complete the work that He started. I'm a vision builder because I'm ready to see that wall come down and to see that sanctuary opened up and filled up with people. When it seems like there's no hope, yeah. God will be there. That's why we're vision builders. Yeah. Jeff and Tony Kane, you guys, it's a new day for you. Your dry season is over. Not that you've really had a big dry season, but I see blessing outpouring the river of God running through your lives, running through your church. Praise and worship's going to spring up. The Holy Spirit will fill that building. I see wealthy men and women being drawn into the house, feeling secure with your financial management. Lord Jesus, touch them. Today, let power flow in Atlanta, Georgia. Let that church grow and increase. I commanded the devil in the name of Jesus. Let them be increased by the power of the Holy Ghost. Come on. Come on. Come on. You see those stories about what God is already doing in our church.
I'm telling you, our dry season is over. When the dry season is over, it's time to plant a seed. That's how it works. You plant a seed and then the rain comes. And when you plant a seed in good soil and you get rain and you get sun, you begin to grow something new. And that thing that you grow returns a harvest. And I believe that's the time for our church. I want to share with you today, if you're visiting with us, man, I just want to invite you to sit back and enjoy hearing a little bit about the vision of our church. If you've been with us for a long time and you're a member of our church, you found one of these in the seat when you sat down and and you should have known this was coming. We've talked about it for a few weeks now. We're going to ask you at the end of this service to join with us, to invest, to sow a seed in the future of what God is doing in this place, because we believe, not that we've got good ideas. I love what Pastor Eric said. It's not about marketing or a sales pitch. We believe that the vision that you're going to hear about today is simply the plan of God for our church. And here's what I want you to walk away with from that. And, and, and Leanna Crumbly said it better than anybody. She said, you know, we are vision builders because we believe that God has a plan for our church that's bigger than anything we could ever ask or imagine, and we're called to be a part of it. I want you to hear that this morning if you're a member of our church, that God has a plan for our church, and you are called to be a part of that. And that's good news, because when you step into the plan that God has for your life, you will find the most fulfilling journey that you've ever been on in your life. I want to read to you this, this uh, scripture out of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, just before we get into all of this, uh, to kick off this Sunday. Uh, Paul's telling the Corinthian church, right before he's about to take up a big offering for the church in Jerusalem, Paul tells this to the Corinthians in church. He says, I want you to have all the time you need to make this offering in your very own way. I don't want anything forced or hurried at the last minute. Remember, a stingy planter gets a stingy crop, a lavish planter gets a lavish crop. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over and make up your own mind about what you will give. That will protect you against sob stories and arm twisting. God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways so that you're ready for anything and everything, more than just ready to do what needs to be done. As the psalmist puts it, he throws caution to the winds, giving to the needy in reckless abandon. His right living, right giving ways never run out, never wear out. This is my favorite part. This most generous God who gives seed to the farmer that becomes bread for your meals is more than extravagant with you. Listen to this. He gives you something you can then give away, which grows into full-formed lives, robust in God, wealthy in every way, so that you can be generous in every way, producing with us a great praise to God. I want to tell you today that this gift, this offering, this... this uh, principle that we're walking through as a church is countercultural. It isn't what anyone outside of this church would tell you to do, but it is God's way. The Bible says, not I think, the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's a tough one. Because I think that's not our natural bent. That's not our natural stance. That's not our natural direction. Our natural direction is I want to give $1, get a lottery ticket, and get $500 million back. Right? I mean, that, that's it. That's like, that's the core of the American dream. One Powerball ticket, $100 million, I'm done. See you later. Take this job and shove it. I don't work here anymore. Right? <laughs> Not for Jeff, but for everybody else. I love my job. But God doesn't work that way. And ask some of those lottery winners how their lives are turning out. And you'll find out that that isn't always the best way to live your life. But God says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And, and, and we read that and go, yes, that's nice, isn't it? That's nice. But it's a whole different world when you believe what God says. And if he says it's more blessed to give than to receive, then the truth of the world the truth of all philosophy, the truth of all understanding when we get to the very core of who we are and who God created us to be, 
then the truth is it's more blessed to give than to receive. But we're just not used to thinking that way. But God doesn't say it's blessed when you give so that you'll receive. I love what Anna Kreth, or Anna Glenn, sorry, Anna, Anna Glenn said in this video. She said it, it wasn't a, Matt's making three times more than he was making two years ago, but it, it wasn't about the money. God was giving us hope. I want to tell you that when you sow your world into the things that God has for you, you'll reap such an abundance in your world that the financial implications will fade away. I'm not saying that God can't bless your financial world. He most certainly can, and he did for Matt and Anna, but the, 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 the key to their testimony is not the financial miracle that came into their world. It's the hope that came back into their house. And I want to tell you today out of this scripture out of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, God desires that you would give into the work he's going to do that you might be blessed so that you might give. And this church, our mission is founded on this same principle that out of the work God's done in our life, out of the change he's made in our hearts, that we might invite everyone in our influence to experience that same full life in Jesus that we've experienced. That's the heart of who we are. That's the heart of what we want to do. We're so overflowing with what God's done in our lives that we just want to go out and invite other people to experience the same thing. And most oftentimes, that means bringing them here to experience the Sundays we experience, to experience the community we've experienced, to experience, I love what Shelby said. She said, I walked in and people started speaking hope into my world. People started speaking positively into my life. People started giving me an opportunity to believe in myself again. What John Wayne Scott said, he said, I came in and, and God was working my world, but I just didn't know what he wanted me to do. And then we read this book. Then the church on every seat, I walked in on Sunday morning on every seat was the purpose driven life. And they gave us this book. And when I read that book, I realized that God had a purpose and a plan for my life. Today in church, I'm going to ask you to, to, to give and to sow a seed into this Vision Builder campaign, but I don't want you to think for a moment that this is about buildings. I don't want you to think for a minute this is about programs. Everything we're going to talk about today, everything we want to do in this church, every vision we have from six months to six years is about people. It's about doing the good works that God planned in advance for us to do, and every one of those works involves people. So I'll tell you, the first thing we want to do as a church with this Vision Builder campaign, our short-term goal, meaning like it's actually one month to probably one year, and it'll go on far beyond that. We want to empower our people because we believe that people are at the core of God's plan, not only for our lives, but for every life, right? The core of the gospel is that God invaded our world, and now we're a light to the world, right? So God's plan doesn't involve good Bible studies. God's plan doesn't involve good community outreach. I mean, it involves that. It's just not centered around that. God's hope for the world is in a, is in a food drive. God's hope for the world is in a soup kitchen. God's hope for the world is that you, in a moment of worship, will invite the Holy Spirit to overwhelm your life. And out of that place, God will be able to do exceedingly abundantly above in your life more than you could ever ask or think. So if his plan is about people, if his plan is centered on you and your life, then I reckon the right thing to do would have our plan be centered in the same place. And you've seen this begin to outwork over the last year, but it's going to expand a lot over the next 12 months. The first thing we want to do is empower our people because we believe that people are the primary resource of our church, God's primary vehicle for reaching the world. So you saw last year, last November, we, you walked into church and on every seat was a book called Draw the Circle, a 40-day prayer devotional to, to dig deeper into your prayer life. And we went through that together as a church. And there's testimony after testimony of people getting changed by the power of prayer in our church because of that book. Because we wanted you to know that prayer is an important component 
Your relation, no one can have a relationship with God for you. It's a personal relationship with Jesus. It's not through me. It's not through Pastor Joe. It's you and him together. So we wanted to encourage you to open up that communication. A couple months later, you walked into the church and on every seat was The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren, the best-selling nonfiction book of all time. And we said, what's the most common question we hear? Well, what, what does God want from me? What's my purpose? Why am I here? So we said, hey, what's the best way to do that? To invent something new or to give the whole church the best-selling book of all time so that they can be empowered to live the life, not that it just seems good to them, but the life they were created to live, the life God planned for them from the very beginning of time. So we gave you the purpose-driven life and asked you to walk with us through a seven-week sermon series, through 40 days of devotion, understanding every morning who God's created not just us to be, but you to be. And then more, more recently, the, in, in August, we gave every member of our church the blessed life, the most challenging one to date. Because it's one thing to ask people to pray, but when you ask people to get generous, they get a little bit more offended. Because <laughs> rubber meets the road. But man, I was challenged. And I, I'll be honest with you, I don't want to read a book that's just not going to challenge me. I don't want to read a book that's just going to tell me about what I'm already doing and how I'm already awesome. I want to read a book that's going to take me somewhere I've never been before. And I can tell you, reading Robert Morris's journey of generosity has changed my life. And I've seen the outworking. Since that time that we gave that book away, I've seen the outworking in his ministry and in related ministries. And I'll tell you, church, it's overwhelming when you get the full extent of what he's doing and the people like him are doing. We went to a church as a team not long ago, and the generosity blew us all away in that place. And it gave us a new vision of who we can be as a church. But the first thing we're going to do is continue to sow in to each and every one of you because we want to help you live the life God called you to live so you can be a light to your world. In our next all-in meeting, our leaders meeting, I'm sure we'll have a, a, an announcement. We're going to do personality profile tests, and we're going to do spiritual giftedness tests. Why are we doing that? Because before you can go and do what God created you to do, we want you to understand who God created you to be. We want you to appreciate the way you're wired. Appreciate the gifts God's given you so that you can steward them the way I know you want to. Everyone wants to know what gifts God has placed in the world, and everyone wants to know how to use those gifts well. You know, we did this as a staff, and I, 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 I'm telling you, over the last year, this isn't like something we put together in a day. We didn't just develop some flyers. You know, Pastor Burton, he didn't just design some stuff, and we threw some words on a sheet of paper. We've thought this through hours and hours and hours over months and months and months, conversation after conversation, tear-filled arguments, or just, you know, <laughs> lively conversations <laughs> about what God wants to do. And I can tell you, we've not only heard from him, but we've seen him in every turn and every corner taking us down this road. So our next all-in meeting, we're going to do these personality profile tests so that you can understand, you know, Pastor Eric and I are different people. We took these personality tests and they put us on a little, a little graph and it was a circle and, and Pastor Eric was over, all the way over here and I was all the way over here. We were polar opposites. If we meet at any point, we disappear off the, the grid. <laughs> because if you want to go to lunch with Pastor Eric, you can say, hey, Pastor Eric, David Roman, he's a great example. Hey, Pastor Eric, I'm, I'm in the Lawrenceville area. You want to do lunch today? Pastor Eric's going to say, sure, I'll meet you at Jimmy John's in five minutes. That's what's going to happen every time. David calls Pastor Eric because Pastor Eric loves Jimmy John's, right? If, if David Roman calls me and says, hey, Pastor Jeff, I'm in the area. I didn't want, want to know if you wanted to do lunch. I'd say, okay, that sounds great. Well, man, what do you feel like? You want like Chipotle or you want chilies? And he'll say what everyone says. I don't know, whatever you want. And I'll go, well, man, I could go for some barbecue or I could go for some, I could go for a burger or man, I don't know. What are you thinking? You thinking like 12 o'clock, 1230? Like when do you want to get together? Like let, let's, let's have a great lunch. If you want a decision to be made, call out Pastor Eric. If you want a strategy meeting about it, call Pastor Jeff, okay? 
we're different people. So what happens is when we're doing this stuff in the church and we're trying to figure out what the vision of our church is, Pastor Eric gets the stance with one foot forward, one foot back. He puts his hands on my desk and he's telling me about the future of our church. And I'm in my chair leaning back all the way going, hey man, I'm cool. Can we just talk about it for a little while? And he's going, no, this is it. Can we please talk about it? No, Pastor Phil Beekler had a vision. Well, I understand that, but I don't remember it. Just trust me. I've got all the flyers printed. No, not yet. I'm not ready for that. Can we get everyone together and talk about it? You have people like that in your life? We're both really aggravating in our own way. But here's what we discovered. We discovered that if we'll recognize that God created each of us the way he created us, and if we'll value that gift that God's placed in the other person, then we'll begin to understand that God put us together for this very reason, so that the push and the pull of our relationship can guide us down the path that he has for us. We want you to live the best life you could ever live, and we want the story of your life to be that God changed your world forever, and then when you settled in to this local church, you found a resource to live that life and live it to the full. The second thing we wanna do is we wanna elevate our atmospheres because our mission statement is for you to invite everyone in your influence, not really to church to full life, right? You don't have to invite them to, to C3's church. I want you to invite them to a relationship with Jesus, really. But, but the truth is, is that the people you invite to a relationship with Jesus, you know, if, you, if you're inviting them, they're probably gonna end up at our church right? Because they're probably not going to be really committed to their local church and not know Jesus, right? So you're going to invite them to Jesus. They're going to say, well, now what do I do? And you're going to say, come to church with me. And they're going to show up here. But let me tell you the truth of Christian living. Everybody loves their church. But when you bring your friend or your family for the first Sunday, every other week, the 51 weeks before that are all beautiful. But that 52nd week, when that person comes to our church for the first time that you've been praying for, that you've been believing for, that you were hoping would walk into these doors, man, you're nervous as a cat. You don't know what songs we're going to sing. You're like, is Pastor Jeff preaching a blessed life today? Because don't let my friend come on the Sunday he's preaching about money. I don't want to preach about tithing on that day. Can you preach like just blessed life, like all, it's, it's all roses. Let him hear something good the first time. Right? And I hope Pastor Joe sings that great song we sang. Do it again, God. Do it again. I want to I get excited. Man, I hope, I hope Penny's on the door. Because when Penny's on the door, man, everybody gets greeted to perfection. And I hope Tim and Bobby McDaniel are standing at the front because they're the most welcoming people. And I hope Katie Foshi is at the desk in the kids' area because I know when my friends bring their neighbors, they won't just get welcomed, but, but Katie Foshi will come around the desk and she'll get down on one knee and she'll look my friend's kids in the eye and say, hey, I'm so glad you're here today. Man, I hope. And you're walking in and, I mean, I've gotten the phone calls. I'm sure Pastor Joe's gotten the phone calls. Hey, my friend's coming to church next week. I was wondering, could you... Um, could you play that song that I really like? Could you play Good, Good Father? I really like it when, when Jen Leo sings Good, Good Father. Could we sing that when it's Father's Day and everything? It would work fine. <laughs> you get nervous. Well, I want to elevate the atmosphere at our church so that when you bring your friends, we steward your friends well. When you bring your family, we steward your family well. And when you make that invitation, you have no hesitation. Because you know that when you bring them in this environment, this environment... From the, from the front of the parking lot to back in the kid's wing, every encounter they have will pull down a wall that's in front of their heart, will open up their, their lives to allowing God to touch and move them in our services. I don't want to create anything fancy. We painted all of our walls gray last year to make it more warm in here because we want people to feel welcome and feel calm when they walk in. I don't want people to notice the lights. I tell Andrew Schwartz all the time, I say, I don't want anyone to notice our lights. I just want the lights to enhance the experience. C.S. Lewis said this, and I love this. C.S. Lewis said, I reckon the best, he doesn't say I reckon, C.S. Lewis is really smart. I just paraphrase because I'm from Georgia. I reckon the best worship experience you could ever have would be one that you scarcely knew existed because the environment all around you would disappear and your only focus would be on your Father in heaven. And that's the atmosphere I want to create in this place. Atmospheres that are invisible, atmospheres that wash away, atmospheres that cultivate the presence of God in people's lives so that lives can be touched and changed here. 
And really at the core of what we want to do for vision builders, that's the core. That's it. That's the, that's the foundational plant. Because here's the thing, as I, as I read Scripture over and over again, I see the same principles of God working themselves over and over again because God never changes. And this is what God says over and over again in the Gospels. He says, if you'll steward well what you've already been given, more will be given to you. If you treat with respect what I've already placed in your hand, then I'll trust you with more. And before I talk to you about reaching one more person, I want to make sure we steward every one of you well. Before we talk about building one more building, I want to talk about stewarding this building that we've already been given well because the principles of God never change. And his principle is this. If you'll care, if you'll steward well what you've already been placed in your hand, then I'll multiply what you've been given. I don't want to do one more thing until I'm sure that we're doing all we can with what God has already given us. Partly because I, I want to make sure I'm living up to the expectation that he has, and partly because I understand his principles. And I know if I want his blessing on this house, if I want to see lives get changed, if I want to see the community come in and us become a community influencing church, if I see all that happen, if I want to see all that happen, then I've got to steward well what I have in my hand today, you and this place. And so that's the first two things we're going to do with our Vision Builder campaign. And once we do that, once we do that, then we'll take the next step. And listen, I know you guys have heard about this. I'm going to show you in just a minute. You know, when, when we do this well, when we steward our people well, and when we steward this building well, I believe God will return a multiplication. And when he does that, we won't fit in this room anymore. Two weeks ago on You Sunday, we had standing room only at the 1115 service. There was not another seat available in the house. And we haven't started any plans for any new buildings yet, right? But I believe that our dry season is over. And I believe that God is going to raise up a harvest in these next few months, in this upcoming year. And I believe we need to be prepared. God says, don't ever be caught unprepared, but always, always be prepared. So as we do that, I want you to know, last year I stood up here and I said, we're going to engage architects so that we can expand our experience. We can expand this experience so that everyone who comes can have the same experience that we've experienced. And so we've done that. And, and Nyler, if you put the lobby shot on the, on the screen, you know, when you walk into this church in the future, you're going to see our front doors are over here and our stairways over there and our cafes there. And there's going to be six new front doors right there going into our new sanctuary through that blue wall over there. And it's going to be an amazing experience for everyone who walks through these doors. And listen, that's not a new plan for our building. That's the original plan for our building. We just want to, we want the vision that we had originally to come to pass in this place because people are coming into this place. Now, will you throw the architectural rendering up there? So we had an architect, Gene Gabriel, referred us to an architect who designed a space for us. And you can see the front doors of the church are, are well, actually, they're right here at the moment. And uh, this is that big overhang outside, and the front doors are here, and as you walk, now you'd walk this way, as you walk into the new sanctuary there, you'd walk straight in underneath all of these seats, walk back around and come up into this stadium seating here for a 750 seat auditorium with a stage and screen in front here. There's rooms, there's rooms all under here, and you can see the staircase that's, um, well, right up there. Uh, the staircase in the lobby would go right to the new doors of the, of the, you can't see that back there. You love this, don't you? It's like a cat. would go right into our new auditorium space. But listen, don't think for one minute, don't, don't, get it, don't, don't think for one minute that, that our goal is to build a building. Right, our goal is to change lives. Right. The truth of the matter is though, is that once you get to about 85% full, people won't come anymore because it's just, it's just not convenient anymore. It's, it's uncomfortable for them and we don't want to create that kind of a space. So we want to plan now so that when the time is right, we can extend our services. And if we want to plan for that, we have to plan financially. So we're asking you today to, to, to come with eyes of faith, seeing what is not as though it were. Seeing not this sanctuary filled, but begin when you walk into these doors, begin to see that sanctuary filled and live in such a way as to reflect that it's already happening. 
because I believe that those stories on that screen are only the beginning. Those stories on that screen are only the beginning. And in three years when, we've, when we're building that sanctuary, and in five years when we've expanded to 750 people in three services, I'm telling you, we will be a church that's an influence in all of our community. We're gonna have more people at the hospital. We're gonna have more people at the college. We're gonna have more people in every high school, every middle school, every elementary school, every workplace, every restaurant. We're gonna have people all around this community for one purpose and one purpose only so that we can take hope, the hope that we have that the Holy Spirit's placed on the inside of us to everyone our influence, that we would be the invitation for them to experience full life in Jesus. And when that happens, we'll become a community influencing church. You remember that, if you were like me last week, you were watching the Weather Channel 24 hours. Hurricane Irma was just circling and circling. You know what she did is she gained strength and gained strength. As she circled and circled, she just kept spinning off storms in every direction, spinning off storms hundreds of miles. I wanna be that Christian hurricane in Gwinnett County. Then on Walter Boulevard, there's a storm brewing and spinning off and spinning off and spinning off in every direction, in every direction, hope, hope for your friends, hope for your family, hope for your kids, hope for the people who haven't even come in to these doors yet. We've got a new sign in production for Walther Boulevard. We just wanna keep building our presence in this community so that we can see people's lives touched and changed. It's the core of all that we wanna do. But today I'm gonna to ask you, you know the the first step in Christian maturity is understanding that when you have your life radically transformed by Jesus and you've, you're living a brand new life, that this message isn't so much about you anymore. Because when God calls you, he says the, most two, the two most important things you can do are love God and love people. When you turn to God, the first thing he does is turn you around and face you towards your community. When you meet him, he sends you back so that you can be a light to every person in your influence, from the checkout girl at Target, to your family at home, to your friends at your workplace. God's sending you so that every one of those people can find the same hope that you have. And today I'm asking you, to step into that level of maturity and turn your life outward and see with eyes of faith what I see, that God is already using this place to transform people's lives, to restore hope, to, to heal the brokenhearted, and to bring people back home. And so I hope that you'll join us. I hope that you'll commit. Sonny, if you just want to come up, Galatians 6 says this. I just want to read this to you while she's coming up. Galatians 6 says, So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. If you've been here for a while, you know. Like, I've been through 20 Vision Builder campaigns. I, but I, I've got I've to fight myself to not get tired of doing good. Because God created and called me to this purpose. And when I get tired, I just turn back to him and he picks me up and he heals me and he turns me back around and says, go get him, tiger. <laughs> for the last two or three years, probably for the last three or five years, Sonny and I have come to you every single year and we've said, hey, we're gonna commit. We believe it's part of our call to lead the way. We don't ever ask you to go places that we won't go ourselves. And so it makes me uncomfortable sometimes to have this moment, but I wanna have this moment because I think it's important. I want you to know, church, that we're not just calling you to step in to faith, but that Sonny and I are stepping with you into faith so that we can go there together as a family. For the last few years, Sonny and I have committed between 10 and $13,000 to the Vision Builder campaign. We fulfilled every pledge we've made. We've been pledging for like 20 years, but that's just the last few. But this year, you know, we both looked at each other and we did the same thing this summer with the Faith for the Future offering. 
We said, you know, if we want God to do something different, we've got to do something different. If we want our lives to change, we have to find a new direction. And so Pastor Eric's been talking these vision chats about stepping forward in faith. And we could commit, again, we did $13,000 last year, above and beyond our tithe. And we, we fulfilled that pledge. And we could do that again. And it's, I mean, it's money, just like it is to you. So it's money that we don't have for other things. But because we've been doing it for a few years, it's kind of comfortable. And we just said, God, we don't want to do what's comfortable. We want to do what you're calling us to do. And so we haven't gotten any raises. We, haven't, we don't have any new sources of income yet. But Sunny and I prayed and agreed together, we're going to commit $25,000 this year to the Vision Builder campaign. Not because we want to impress you, but because we want God to move in our worlds in a way that we can't believe. And so we're going to step forward in a way that we can't believe. Now listen, we have savings, and about half of that's going to come from our savings. The other half is going to come from a, a monthly gift that we're going to give. And I don't know where all of that's going to come from, but faith doesn't know where everything's going to come from. Faith sees what is not as though it were. And so we're going to stand in belief that as we commit ourselves to God, that God's going to commit to us. And as a church, our goal this year, it's been $250,000, $300,000 for the last three years. This year, we're going to $400,000 as a goal for our church. And I want to tell you, it's good. I want to tell you that on Friday night, we got our, our vision builder leaders together and we, we, we pre-pledged. And on Friday night, we raised $330,000 in pledges already for the future of our church. Man, that's good. I'm so, man, I was so inspired by your generosity. But if you haven't yet pledged, what that means is there's, there's more to do. We haven't hit 400 yet. And so I'm gonna ask you now to consider partnering with us. And it's still a big step to take. It's not like it's been done. This is, a, this is still a lot more to go ahead. We need you to join with us so we can see God do all that he has planned for this community, for this church.